Hello, everybody. Hello, Tope. Hello. Welcome to Helsinki. Thank you. So, Tope just landed uh, 15 minutes ago from Atlanta, so he's still acclimating uh, <laughs> to the uh, dark and the cold, but uh, great to have you here. It's great to be here. My first time in Helsinki. So just, uh, I'll give a quick personal intro. So I'm uh, one of the partners at Iconic. Um, I joined a couple of years ago to launch our office in London. Uh, for those of you who don't know Iconic, we're a global growth fund. Uh, our differentiation is really that uh, we have a very unique uh, network of founders, families, and CEOs on behalf of whom we invest in the next generation of founders. Uh, and we've been, over the last 10 years, have invested and partnered with some of the most impactful software companies uh, of last decade, uh, companies like IDN and Miro and Snowflake and GitLab, Procore, many others. Um, we've also invested in a number of companies that started out with a viral product-led growth uh, motion and, and then subsequently added on uh, more of a sales-led motion to expand beyond individuals uh, to tackle teams and companies of all sizes. Uh, and that's really the crux of, of our conversation today. Uh, we've worked with companies like Datadog and Airtable and, and 1Password that have all done that, that well, and uh, of course, Calendly. And so it's, uh, I'm really glad that uh, Tope agreed to do this. He's, uh, he's someone that we've long admired, uh, even before uh, formally partnering him, uh, with him uh, a few years ago, not only because of what uh, he built Calendly into today, but uh, He's also incredibly thoughtful and articulate about the journey. So I know we're going to learn a lot uh, in this session. Um, rather than me giving a long-winded intro of you, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, share a little bit about your uh, personal background and what Calendly is. I will do that. Um, my name is Topa Watana, founder and CEO of Calendly. Started Calendly 10 years ago out of a very simple frustration of, you know, um, I was a sales rep. I spent, you know, a lot of my a lot of my work was uh, you know, trying to get, uh, meet with our customers and prospects. And this one particular meeting was just too, took too many weeks and too many emails back and forth to get it scheduled. I thought there had to be a better way um, and uh, decided to start Calendly. And fast forward to now, we started from this simple scheduling product to uh, you know, a true platform uh, that supports uh, individuals uh, and small teams and even large organizations um, all, across the, all across the globe. Um, that's what we do. It's great, and it, Tope is unfailingly humble, so, but I'll, I would add that Calendly is now used by over 20 million people, uh, 100,000 plus companies, and uh, as you said, all over the world, 200 plus countries, so uh, it's truly a household name within uh, productivity software, so really incredible what you, you have built. Um, I'd like to spend Tope most, most of the time uh, on the more recent history in Calendly, but I think just for context and to help frame sort of how you've thought about building the company, let's rewind a bit and start with a bit more of the founding story. And you, you mentioned that you were an enterprise sales rep, felt the pain point of scheduling firsthand before starting Calmly. Um, but what ultimately compelled you to quit your job and uh, you know, go all in? Yeah, so before I started Calmly, I was a serial entrepreneur, so I was lucky to work uh, for a number of uh, companies that I'd learned a lot from. I started at IBM, uh, you know, the 800-pound uh, gorilla in tech at the time, and you know, still a dominant uh, company today. And then from there, I went to a startup. And during the, my time at that startup, I really learned the founding story of that business, and I got inspired by it. And so I decided that I, too, wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had a lot of uh, <laughs> business ideas that I threw out there to the world. Ultimately, I had about four, and I shut all of them down. So uh, I, was, uh, um, I was undeterred all the same. And one of the things I realized after those failures is that I was pursuing these business ideas because I wanted to pursue a business, not because I actually really had a, a unique problem, a unique solution that I wanted to bring to the world. Um, and so I decided I was going to take a hiatus from from uh, you know, just uh, taking stabs in the dark and really try to find something that I was passionate and, uh, about solving. And then it just fell on my lap, this uh, problem with scheduling. And given sort of like my, um, you know, my struggles with the previous businesses, I actually uh, did not start this as one, into, I, I didn't go into this wanting to start a business. I went into this looking to learn about the space and the challenges. And the more I, the more I learned, the more excited I became about the problem. What I saw was that, you know, 
Scheduling is a massive problem in the sense that, especially the types of meeting that, meetings that Calendly schedules today, those meetings have an outsized impact on the, uh, on the success of a company. The average knowledge worker spends over 50% of their time in meetings, uh, which is, you know, translates to about 1,000 meetings uh, a year. And if you multiply that by a billion workers, a billion knowledge, knowledge workers globally, that's a trillion meetings on, a, on an annual basis. And so you begin to see the size of the opportunity. If you can optimize just a little bit of, uh, uh, of those meetings, there's a lot of uh, productivity to be had, and there's a lot of uh, improved business outcomes to be had. And uh, that's really what got me fascinated about the problem. It's a, it's a pain point I'm sure we can all uh, appreciate uh, ourselves. Yeah, I think one of the unique things about how you started Calendly was that you didn't raise much outside capital, um, certainly not at the beginning. I think I I, I've heard that you, you took, invested all your life savings and then some and uh, took out some personal loans. What was, it, what was it like to bootstrap in those early days? What were the pros and cons of doing that? And you know, how did that really shape how you thought about building Calendly from there? Yeah, I mean, I... Uh... <laughs> Uh, you know, I had the idea for Calendly, and uh, I just knew that I needed to get started as soon as I could. And rather than waiting on uh, trying to raise money, trying to find a technical co-founder, I basically emptied my, my 401k, my savings, and even took out some loans to, uh, to solve the problem because I, um, I was that convinced that, you know, there's a big problem here and I could be a, play a part in solving it. Unfortunately, I was not really good at... It, it was tough for me to raise money for a number of different reasons. One. I did not exactly have a strong track record as an entrepreneur with four filled businesses. I didn't, uh, the space itself was not a, uh, a space, there were no major successes, successes in the calendar and scheduling space. Um, so for all those reasons, it was tough to raise money. And so I really had a uh, bootstrap and I ended up flying to Ukraine and hiring a team of engineers when we built the initial version of the product and that probably began to take off. Um, but soon enough, I ran out of money. And, um, um, uh, but it, after a lot of uh, pitches, I ended up meeting a, a man by the name of David Cummins, serial entrepreneur, very, very successful entrepreneur and investor in Atlanta. He invested $350,000 in 2014, and we took that $350,000, and uh, really, uh, it's really essentially what scaled the business even till today. Yes, we've raised some money, institutional capital from you and a few others in the last few years, um, but really the... Uh, those are just dollars hidden in our balance sheet. They haven't really gone into the operations of the business. Um, but back to uh, the pros and cons of bootstrapping. When you don't have to worry about, you know, when you know you can't raise money, <laughs> it forces you to really um, go win with customers, right? And so what Calendly ended up doing is became, we became maniacally focused on the problem we were trying to solve. And we had to monetize early. And because we had to monetize early, allowed us to really understand um, where we had the strongest product market fit. Like, what were the uh, cohort of customers that our product really resonated with and had the, the strongest ROI, the most compelling ROI with our product? So I would say that the challenges of fundraising meant that we had to really win with our customers and it for forced us to be uh, focused in what we built and who we, who we built it for. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. I think, uh, I think I heard that you ran out of money just before launching a paywall. And so a lot of the early users were passionate about the product and using it, but you weren't able to monetize until, uh, until afterwards. But uh, clearly, clearly something, uh, you know, you were able to win the hearts and minds of those users. What was the moment where that flywheel got spinning? Like, how did you actually get that going in the beginning? Was that something deliberate that you did or, or did it kind of... Was it more accidental? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of a lot of different things. It was definitely a, an iterative process. Um, I, think the first, you know, I think the first part of it is luck, right? In the sense that we happen to pick a problem that's viral by nature, right? So there's no way to use Calendly without introducing other people to it. So we got lucky there. Uh, the second part is the addressable market is large, right? There are lots of products in which, as you use it, you introduce other people to it, but you don't really get that flywheel going because ultimately the addressable market of that product, product, product is small, so you don't get this vicious, this virtuous cycle of, I discover the product, I turn around and begin using it for myself. So, you know, the other part of that was, sorry, the large addressable market. Um, and then pricing and packaging played a role. The product started initially as free because 
uh, I ran out of money. But in doing that, what that, what that allowed us to do is it just um, uh, it reduced the barriers to use the product. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll say the first thing is the, the free plan, having a free product allowed us to really increase the total number of people active on the platform. Yeah. So, you know, increase uh, weekly um, average active users. And the second thing we began to then focus on is how do you improve the quality of, those, of that active usage? And so one metric that we pay a lot of attention to accountly is median intensity, which is um, the average number of meetings booked by a Calendly user in a given period. And so we began to uh, implement a, a series of product improvements that would improve that meeting intensity. And then the third thing we then began to do is began to um, you know, execute against a product strategy that really allowed us to uh, capture as much of that addressable market. So you had this virtual cycle of people discover the product, they use it, the quality of their usage uh, increases, which means they're scheduling more and more meetings. And then uh, we began to uh, serve not just individuals in SMB, but for teams and yep. mid-market customers in a lot of different industries. And all of those things just really contributed back to the, uh, the created that, uh, that flywheel, as you described it. Makes a ton of sense. And then at what point did you sort of layer on the more sales-led motion to augment kind of that uh, viral product-led growth that you've had? Yeah, we tried to not ever have a sales team. <laughs> but it failed miserably, and I'm glad it failed. <laughs> um, you know, I came from a background in enterprise sales. And, um, you know, frankly, I got tired of that. And the reason I got tired of that is I, the, I see the future as, you know, giving buyers the choice um, instead of, you know, hiding your, your product behind a a lead form and people have to talk to you to find out the price. I think you should just let the product do the, do the selling and create a product that's so compelling and so easy to use that customers can realize uh, value without any human assistance. So, and by the way, we would have never gotten to where we got, to where we, where we were if we, if we needed a sales team, right? Because we, we were very lightly capitalized. Yep. So being able to build a self-serve business meant that in the early days of the business, it grew very slowly. Um, uh, but very, very uh, efficiently. Uh, but fast forward to the sales team, what we saw was that our customers were really pulling us, telling us, asking us to do more. So in the beginning, when, my, when I thought about Calendly and scheduling meetings, I was really thinking about the friction of getting that meeting on the books. But it turns out that meetings in a lot of ways are sort of the atomic uh, unit of, of business, right? So acquiring a customer, a new customer starts with scheduling a meeting with them, acquiring a, uh, hiring a, a candidate starts with scheduling that first interview. And so meetings end up triggering all these different processes, and these processes involve integrating into other systems, sure. pulling, you know, bringing additional people into the platform. And as we just followed our customers down that path of, it's great that you schedule a meeting with me, but really what I, I don't want to just schedule a meeting. What my ultimate goal is to convert a prospect to a customer. To do that, I need to trigger all these different processes. Point is, like, you know, it just became, it became more complex over time. Yep. And, um, and even though it was possible for our users to be able to do all those things themselves, ultimately they wanted to talk to somebody on the phone to really understand how they could use the product and, you know, uh, and, get, a little, and get some consultative ad ad advice. We were hesitant to, uh, to, to, do that, to do that initially, but what we found was a couple of things. One, we discovered that the LTV of every single customer was not the same, right? Sure. The kind of customers who wanted to talk to us on the phone, when we did talk to them on the phone, like you know, a perfect example was this, we had this bookkeeping service. Um, they wanted to initially start with 10 users and they want to talk to us on the phone. We didn't think that really needed a conversation, but we did talk to them. They started with those 10 users, and in a space of six months, it grew to 120 users, right? So there are all these anecdotal stories of when we, when we gave, provided a medium touch experience, yep. not only did we acquire those customers, those types of customers um, grew uh, over time. So what we began to do is really try to understand, like, what are the signals that predict the customers whose lifetime value is worth, you know, uh, uh, a higher uh, customer acquisition cost for. And that was the, sort of the genesis of our sales team. So it started as just a series of product experts 
just you know, talking to the customers on the phone, and then it became more consultative sales reps. Um, but that's sort of the evolution. Yeah, makes a, makes a ton of sense. I think when, when I, you started working, when we started working with Iconic, the, the enterprise sales motion was relatively nascent. Um, you know, fast forward a few years, it's, I think you've, I think I read recently that you have like 86% of the Fortune 500 are Calendly customers. What, what, when you think about kind of working with the larger enterprises, what were some of the challenges that you encountered um, both on the product and the sales side? Yeah, uh, so I think even, even, with, uh, even though we have a sales team now, 90% of our customers on our revenue still really starts with our initial you know, uh, footprint in, in a company is usually through the self-serve uh, channel, right? So what ends up happening is an individual user in a large company uses the product, they want to introduce it to their team, or they, it starts spreading in the, in the company, and then IT finds out about it, they want to roll it out on a uh, wider basis, and then they begin to have a lot of questions, right? Some of the things they care about, they care about security, um, they care about compliance in highly regulated industries like financial services and healthcare, they care about, um, you know, Purchasing, um, you know, procurement flexibility. Like they don't want just to, uh, uh, you know, maybe they want a three-year uh, agreement, for example. Sure. Uh, so, essentially, what we ended up doing is it became a company-wide effort over time. It started with sales, like I said, but over time, it also became marketing. In marketing, we began to think about uh, messaging and positioning and attending conferences and lead routing. Right? Those are things we didn't really think yep. about before because we were sending it right to the self-serve channel. We be, on the product side, we, were, we began to introduce capabilities that address those security concerns and uh, you know, granular uh, permissions, for example. And then on, on, on the GNA side, we started uh, redlining agreements, which are things that we didn't do before. Uh, we began to do security reviews and we stood up a, an entire team that uh, handled that efficiently. And then, uh, on the pricing and packaging side, we began to introduce an enterprise plan that, uh, that sort of wrapped up all the capabilities that those enterprise customers have. Yeah. When you think, I mean, you're, the, the breadth of customers by segment, the use cases, you know, the sectors that you're addressing is, is incredibly broad. How do you, how do you find focus um, you know, and, you know, w within that opportunity and make sure that you don't leave anybody behind and that you're kind of serving all these customers so well? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the diversity of our customers is one of the ex most exciting things about the business. Yeah. It's also very intellectually stimulating. It's also very, very, very tough. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I can't say that we've perfectly balanced it, but I think that the times in which we've, been, we've made the best decisions are those in which we've truly underst uh, understood like the, the, uh, you know, the relative LTV of different customer cohorts. Initially, we sort of served a very, very wide audience of anybody who needed to schedule a meeting, whether internal or external. And then we introduced a paywall you know, in 2014. And what we found was we had stronger product market fit with uh, people looking to schedule external meetings. The ROI of those meetings were just higher for them. Um, and then gradually over time, we did a, yet, yet a much more rigorous, rigorous analysis over the next few years, and we realized that sales, customer success, and recruiting, and executives were much higher LTV for different reasons. Yep. Uh, for sales meetings, uh, you know, ultimately those were directly tried to, tied to revenue. For customer success, there was a co correlation between that to retention. And then for executives, we found executives to be uh, one of the most important Trojan horses to get into a, uh, a company. So if the CEO is using the product, it makes it a lot easier for, the, sure. uh, you know, for them to send a note to the sales team saying you can be way more efficient. So we went through that analysis and that's really how we've been able to sort of uh, prioritize uh, the customer course we wanted to focus on. And then in addition to that, we, we did that sequentially. Like it wasn't, today we serve SMB, mid-market customers, and enterprise customers, we didn't always serve those very well on day one. It took every bit of 10 years to do that. Yep. And so we just did uh, that sequentially. It's an incredible challenge, uh, but also an incredible opportunity, as you said. Um, what are the, the theme of Slush this year is uh, building to last. And when you think about you know, how quickly uh, technology is evolving, you know, especially with the advances in AI and how accessible that's becoming, 
How do you really foster a culture of innovation uh, within your product teams to kind of stay ahead of the curve and uh, you know, stay ahead of any competitors that uh, may be encroaching on your, yeah. your turf? That is not very hard to do. And the reason it's not hard to do is exactly uh, where you left off. We are in a very, very competitive uh, market. Every single day, there's a new Calendly competitor that uh, uh, is looking to uh, you know, take a shot at us. So I think it just you know, forces us to be, be our best. The second part is it is very difficult to not run into a Calendly customer on a given day. So our, and our customers are very, very generous with their feedback. So through our, you know, our great customers who provide us, who are very generous with their feedback and a very, very competitive market, it is very difficult to, uh, to get complacent. Yep. 100%. Uh, when you just kind of staying on the theme of AI for a second, how do you how do you see that sort of playing a role within the product? How have you added it to um, you know solving more problems around scheduling and meeting efficiency? Yeah, I mean, I'll maybe step back a little bit and say you know I, we've been doing Calendly for ten years now, and in those ten years, I don't think there's been as much innovation in in meetings and productivity as we've seen in the last three, four years. There's a lot of really exciting things that are happening. And AI is enabling a lot of the things we've thought about for a long time and uh, making them possible. So we see AI as uh, just a great reset in, in, in uh, approachability and accessibility of our product, right? Our product today, uh, we like to, you know, we take a lot of effort to, we've made a lot of effort to make it really simple. Uh, for a lot of different types of use cases, but you know, there's still you know, a little bit of a barrier and a paradigm shift that you have to embrace and be able to adopt Calendly. And AI you know, provides an opportunity f for you not to really understand Calendly lingo, but really just express what you want in, in simple language and for Calendly to interpret that. Interpret that. So that's an area that we're focused on, is how do we uh, make uh, Calendly that much more uh, accessible and easy to use for people who don't really want to get a Calendly PhD to use the product. Yep. Um, so that's one step. The other step is that you know, we see our, we're excited not just to help you schedule your meetings, but really to help you make your meetings productive. I talked earlier about a uh, you know, trillion uh, meetings happening on an annual basis. The vast majority of those meetings are not run well. Um, and they're not run well because people don't want to. It takes a lot of effort to run a really good meeting. It takes thoughtfulness and a good memory to actually put together an, uh, um, an effective agenda. It takes a lot of work to make sure that you follow up effectively on the items that were discussed and that, that action items uh, aren't forgotten. Um, and we see an opportunity to help with all of those. Uh, and we think AI can play a, a, a very, very important role throughout that entire journey of preparation for a meeting, host a meeting effectively, following up effectively, all this you know, uh, virtual cycle to nurture relationships and drive uh, customer and business outcomes. I've heard you talk about um, the meeting lifecycle management as you know, part of the evolution for Calendly. Is that what you mean by that? That's and, exactly uh, what I mean by that, okay. yeah. And to be clear, like we, you know, one of the uh, Calendly today has over 100 integrations, so we don't, we don't see ourselves as doing all these things yep. uh, natively, uh, but it's really being that orchestrator of all these important actions and tasks that need to be that need to happen for a meeting to be successful. We see ourselves as the, being the being the glue and the orchestrator for that. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, as Calendly has become synonymous with scheduling automation, a great insertion point from which to kind of expand and own that that broader uh, meeting management. Anything on the horizon from a product perspective that uh, you can share with everybody in terms of uh, what you're particularly excited about? Yeah, um, man, where do I start? Um, so, I, <laughs> you know, we were working on a number of different uh, AI uh, prototypes. Uh, hope to be able to launch something and uh, make something generally available in the next few months. Um, I think you'll see Calendly uh, become more people-centric in the next few months. So today, sort of like the organizing pr principle of Calendly is, you know, is meetings and, you know, event types, which is a set of rules that govern how you want to accept meetings, uh, but we see an opportunity to actually humanize all of that um, and really, like I said, help our customers not just schedule meetings, but really to nurture relationships. So those are some of the th uh, things that we're working on that we're very excited about. That's amazing. Well, I think we're about out of time, but uh, it's been an incredible decade and, uh, for Calendly, and it's been a lot of fun uh, seeing how, how the company is uh, just 
blown out, uh, blown everything out of the water in terms of how far you've come, and uh, incredibly excited for what's to come. So thank you again for being here and for uh, sharing the story with all of us. Thank you.